you know how much it costs per CPU to run a Microsoft SQL server? Don't thousands think of dollars. Oh no, <laughs> you have no crazy. idea. You have no idea. Thousands. Like it was like the CPU level. Microsoft was going to get a bigger check from Miami Beach than we were. So I said to Ed at that point, I was like, dude, we're never going to survive in this game with the licensing costs. Should I call you Bill or William? Bill is good. That's my nickname, which honestly is crazy because I didn't know this was a problem until I started going to Europe. Like you grow up and everybody knows where I live that Bill is the nickname for William. Yeah. And then people started asking me questions about it. And I suddenly realized that I had a problem because I was using William in some places and Bill in the other and nobody had any clue what was going on with my name. So you've settled on Bill. Oh, I've always settled on. So here's the thing. For people who have nicknames, they'll appreciate what I'm going to sell you. When you have a nickname like Bill, where your legal name is William, then your legal name is only used when you're in trouble. <laughs> so you almost don't want to hear William because it just makes the hairs on the back of your neck go up. Because this is either serious, you're in trouble, something legal, so I just don't like hearing William too often because it usually doesn't, it's not a good situation. <laughs> All right. I'll, yeah, that makes sense. I'll stay away from William. I'm super <laughs> excited to have you on. Bill Kennedy, founder of Arden Labs. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Wow, man. I'm 53 years old. I could take a little bit of time. I've seen the, <laughs> have I really seen this? Have I really seen myself revolve around the sun 53 times? No, but. No, I'm just a software developer, man. I'm not, I'm not any, anyone or anything special. I've been writing code professionally since 1991. Started with some C programming, moved to C Sharp, then moved to Go, and I hope to retire with this language. I really am not excited about learning another language. I've played with Rust a little bit. I got back cornered into playing with it because somebody at Arden decided to write a blog post and I had to review it. And at that point I had to dig in and I think I could probably learn to love the language, but it's a completely different mindset in terms of design philosophies, guidelines, idioms, the, even the language designers had different things in mind with the pat, pattern matching and stuff. Yeah. And so it's just foreign to me with how much I love Go's philosophies. But I think if you told me like my life depended on learning Rust, I feel like I could do it. It'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. I want to pull on that thread more here in just a bit and chat about Rust and this natural comparison that everyone seems to make between Go and Rust. But I, I want to give our listeners just a little bit more of a kind of grounding in who you are and what you've done. Can you, so your, your handle everywhere is going go.net. Does that mean that at some point in the past you switched to go from a .net stack? Was that like a big changing point in your career? So this is how ridiculous my handle is. Okay. <laughs> I was basically coding in C sharp for 20 something years in the Microsoft stack. And wasn't involved at any level. I didn't go to conferences. I wasn't involved in social media, nothing. So when I switched to Go in 2013, I told my business partner I was going to start writing blog posts. I was always an educator, but it was always local vocational school or company wide. So I said, I'm going to, I'm, and, I, and I did publish some C sharp stuff, to be fair. But I said, I'm going hedge down and I'm just going to publish this stuff. So then somebody says, you got to be on Twitter, right? This is like 2013, let's say. So I'm asking people, is there a book on how to be on Twitter? Like I wanted a book <laughs> to teach me how to be on social media areas. Dude, I didn't even know what a hashtag was. I think first time I used a hashtag, somebody was like, Bill, you're using it wrong. That's not how hashtags work. 
I'm like, I'm old, <laughs> not that old at that point. I guess I'm, what is that? In my forties at this point, no experience. Okay. So my brain says, okay, you're not going to put your personal life out there. Let's come up with a handle that kind of keeps your personal life away. So I had a blog that, and I got a domain called goinggo.net. I got the domain, right? It was a hard thing to do even at the time to find a good domain yeah. for the blog. So I said, I'm going to learn Go. So I found this domain, goinggo.net. And I said, you know what? That's going to be my handle on Twitter because me thinking I'm a marketing genius says my handle is like the name of the blog, then there's a connection and people can go to goingo.net, right? And like, this was like brilliant, right? This is me thinking I'm brilliant. So I don't know what happens. Like a few years in, I realized goingo.net is probably not the best. And I was able to get my own name still at the time. Yep. And I actually renamed my handle, I think to like, Bill Kennedy or something. I don't remember. Something personal at that point. <laughs> Here's so the did the dot .net have nothing to do with like dot .net from and then the dot .net to do the domain? <laughs> so I'm, I've been misreading it this whole time. That's no, awesome. yeah, period net. Period net. Like I told you it was bad. <laughs> so I finally decide I'm going to switch it out. And this is how like, again, old school stuff here. I had just printed a thousand, 2000 business cards. I had literally just printed these cards. Okay. And on the card, I had my going, go down that handle. So I switched out my handle name and somebody looks to me and says, Bill, we just paid God knows what for business cards. And now they're all useless because you changed your, and we're not buying you new ones. Ryan's my business partner. I'm like, fine, I'll put it back. So I ended up going back. All because of business cards. That's all so funny. I because, forgot about business cards. Yes. All because <laughs> of business cards. Um, oh, that's amazing. I put it back. And at this point, for better or worse, that's what people know me as from a handle perspective. So yeah. now it's really too late to change it just because there's awareness there. Yeah, and you that's, keep that, that's how I knew you. I, that's so funny. I'm glad we clarified. I always assumed that at some point in the past, there was some big switch in your tech stat from dot net to go there was there was in 2013 but that's not where the name came from yeah yeah okay so tell me about what 2013 that go was what two years old 1.2 i think was released at least that's the first version i played with yeah okay so what made you excited about go how did you even hear about it way back then so i wasn't excited in 2011 i started arden labs with my business partner we were both C sharp Microsoft shop developers. We had a very similar background when we met in like 2009 or 10. So okay. we decided at the end of 2010 to start a company doing consulting. Ed had already some good experience working with American express and some other clients. And he found us a client and he said, Bill, let's go do this. Let's, let's start this company. So we did. And we were writing in C-sharp and writing Windows services and all that good stuff. And then around 2013, beginning of 2013, Miami Beach, the city of Miami Beach, had this proposal out there to build software. Okay, it was a big project. Mobile app, browser apps, the whole nine yards. And we were like, let's see if we can win this. At least let's try. So yeah. these city level proposals you have to do are insane, dude, right? They're like, you have to have experience doing them. But one of the parts of it is what is this going to cost? Not just in terms of my time, but in terms of hosting it and running it. So when we did that exercise, we looked at each other and we realized that Microsoft was going to make more money than we were on the project because oh. of the licensing. This was before Azure. Like the cloud, Azure cloud maybe had just being mentioned, but at this point, people are still running their own data centers. So to be um, clear, you're using Microsoft's tech stack. That's and, right. And that's where the fees, that's how you know Microsoft's going to make out like a bandit on the- Oh, dude, you know how much it costs per CPU to run a Microsoft SQL server? 
It's Don't, thousands thankfully. of dollars. Oh no, <laughs> you have no crazy. idea. You have no idea. Thousands. Like it was like the CPU level. Yeah, yeah. So you pay a license per CPU just to run the software. Yeah. On oh yeah, yeah. Now, on the SQL server you did, it was pricing wow. was really expensive. The thing about the cloud at the time was the pricing changed and it be, started to pretend it felt more affordable. Okay. But when it when you calculated all the licensing costs, if you were going to legitimately pay, which the city of Miami would have to, yeah, Microsoft was going to get a bigger check from Miami Beach than we were. So I said to Ed at that point, I was like, dude, we're never going to survive in this game with the licensing costs. We got to move to Linux. Now, Ed had already started moving in that. Ed's always been ahead of me in, the, in these situations. So he's already been playing with Ruby. He's already been learning Linux. I just didn't want to have to learn a whole nother operating system and everything again. I was, anytime I have to learn something that big, I get like depressed at first <laughs> and then I get, get through my depression and then I just go heads down. It's yeah. every new thing. It's depression, fight through it, and then you feel better for it. And we have to get off of Windows. So I started looking at different programming languages. I didn't like Ruby, didn't like Python. I always had a compiler in front of me. I didn't like any of that. I looked at Erlang, didn't feel right. And I just went back to Ed and I said, you know what? I'm going to have to stay on the C-sharp side and our back end is just going to have to be Windows and we'll have to figure it out. All the front end stuff could be in Ruby and all that. Go for it. You're going to do that code anyway, but I'm not writing C again. I'm telling you this, I'm not going back to writing C and I don't find any affinity with any of these programming languages. So as a last ditch effort, Ed says to me, why don't you look at this programming language called Go? I just, this just popped up on his radar screen and I was pushing back. I'm like, dude, I'm done, man. I just, um, I don't know, Bill, take a look at this programming language. So it was like over the weekend, fought to get it installed because it wasn't Microsoft, right? It's create a workspace and down. It was everything I was not using. Yeah. And it was like different back then with, I didn't even really write in Go 1.2, but like, I remember pre-modules and everything. Yeah, no, it's, it was, and the editor at the time was Light IDE, which actually was not a bad editor. I think it's still around. If it wasn't for Light IDE, I may not even be talking to you right now. So <laughs> somehow I got it all running in Light IDE and I started building small programs and learning it and it. It just felt right at that point. Once I got through that hump, I realized within a couple of hours that this was a programming language that I felt some affinity to. So at that point, I had told Ed, okay, I think we can do this with Go. And then I convinced one of my clients to let me start writing Go for the stuff we were building because they didn't care what it was built in. They just wanted some stuff done. Yeah. So I ended up porting some C-sharp code that I had in to go and never looked back. Wow. So this is 2013, go 1.2. Uh, amazing. I had a similar, I, had a, I guess I had a similar experience. I, I learned a lot of C sharp or not C sharp, uh, C plus plus in college and moving to go for the compile speeds, the tool chain, no need for make files. Like the simplicity was really what did it for me. What was it that you enjoyed? And like, again, I'm not even familiar with Go 1.2, but what was it about the language that made you look at it different than say Ruby? It felt like C and C sharp without all the object oriented crap, if I can say that. Um, <laughs> you can say that, yeah. All the affinity to it. I knew I could write code in this and maintain it and have mental models. And there was a lot that I learned from the time 2013 till now. And my skill set and my understanding of computers and computer science and everything went way up thanks to this language, right? Things I wouldn't have learned, I think, staying in the C-sharp ecosystem. But it just it felt right. It felt like me. I was able to move forward with it. Yeah. One of my favorite things about Go, especially from the education perspective, is it feels like there's still a lot of abstractions in Go, right? The standard library does a lot of heavy lifting for us. But it just feels like the abstractions give you a lot of control or at least a lot of ability to learn closer to what's going on under the hood. And to give you an example of what I mean, I started building web servers with Django in Python, and I felt like I had no idea what was happening ever. 
<laughs> like I have to set up some WSGI gateway and hook it up to an Nginx proxy. I don't get why that has to happen. And then there's this framework and it's maybe doing some stuff with the database, but I don't have to write any SQL. When I started writing my first couple services in Go, the web really started to make sense to me. Yeah, readability is about understanding the cost of that code you're writing and understanding kind of what it's doing, right? You can look at it and have a mental model of how that's going to behave and the cost of that. And simplicity is about hiding complexity. The problem that I see is people want to focus on simplicity to make things simple up front. And what happens is you lose your readability and you can't do it in that order. And Go, the compiler, the runtime, the entire ecosystem is about this beautiful balance of readability and simplicity. The hiding of complexity without hiding your ability to understand what's going on. That doesn't happen overnight. That takes a huge amount of experience and refactoring and knowledge, which the Go team had. So to me, I think that's what we're talking about here with Go. It, and the language shows you how to get there too. If you're interested in learning that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. So tell me about the development of Arden Labs over this time. So in 2013, it was called Arden Labs back then. We actually, the name of the company was Arden Studios. And we still have that name. You can think of that as the parent company. And the okay. idea of studios was, what was Microsoft's editor? Visual Studio. So we thought, and my business partner didn't want a name that was so obvious, which I always felt was a mistake, but right, he didn't want people to just absolutely know what we do. So he thought an Arden is an Irish word that means platform. So it was like, Arden Studios was this like studio that built these software platforms. Cool. But I think over time, there, there was this moment, I don't know what year it was, maybe it's 2015 or 16, where labs started becoming the big thing. Everybody was labs, labs. And I was at that point getting tired of people asking me, what does your company do? I wanted it to be obvious. And Arden Studios made us look like we were more of an art sort of company film company or art oh, okay, side yeah. company when we were like core engineering. So I proposed that we started doing business as Arden Labs to give us some more of that tech edge. And that's what we ended up doing. I don't remember what year we switched using the labs name. We started as Arden Studios. I think it was a cool name too. And correct me if I'm wrong, the kind of the core business of Arden Labs over the years has primarily been kind of building software for third-party clients. So you don't necessarily maintain your own software products that you sell, but you're building software for other companies. Is that accurate? Yeah, the primary revenue is consulting and staff og and projects for other companies. We dabble, we have dabbled in our own products. We're dabbling in one right now. Building a product's really hard. It's just super hard. So we've invested time and money into products. Nothing yet that I feel like has hit. I'm hoping this new one, which I'm not going to talk about right now, has some legs, but we do that. And then the training was kind of feeds the consulting, right? They feed each other. Yeah. And I don't know if Arden Labs would be as big without the training. And I'm not sure the training would be as big without the consulting. It, it fits hand in hand. The problem with training um, and why I, I think you don't see a lot of companies like mine was the pay cycle that you get paid, right? You go get do a training for a big company, let's say Intel. You ain't getting paid for 90 days if you're lucky. So Just because of wanted, how they bill? How they how, do how internal all this billing? Building gets paid. Oh, yeah. So if you want to get into the training business, there's money there, but you better have six months of cash reserve to, to play that game. So what's cool is the consulting can bring money in every month, right? Which gives you time to wait to get paid on the training side. And if a consultant consultancy has decided to stop paying you for whatever reason, the accounting department had a glitch. Then they got some training <laughs> money going in. We've been able to manage cash flow really nicely having both sort of revenue streams. But if I had to guess, it's probably like 
30, 70, 70 on the consulting side. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. In theory, backend banter viewers, they're learning backend development, right? Probably in Go and Python, and they're trying to figure out where they should take their career. And sometimes there's this choice that needs to be made as you're a self-taught developer, you're trying to break into the industry of, should I go work for a product-based company? Should I go work for a consultancy? Should I freelance on my own? In fact, Daniel, one of our graduates at Boot Dev, ended up going to work for you at Arden, which is how I came to know you. Do you have, could you like weigh those options? Like how would you look at that if you were entering the industry? I don't know if that's even possible to imagine at the moment, but. It's a personality problem more than anything else. So when I started consulting, my business partner had already been doing it for, I don't know how many years. And the first thing he said to me was don't get comfortable. And at that point you used to go to the client's office, right? It wasn't remote. So you don't get comfortable anywhere. Be able to leave in 30 seconds or less. Just, if you want to put a picture on the desk they assigned to you, that's fine. But 30 seconds or less, you have to be able to leave. And the thing was that you can't, feel any sort of ownership in anything you're doing because you don't work there. You're being hired to solve some problem. And as quickly as you got in, you can quickly be taken out. And it's not personal. It just is what it is. So 30 seconds or less, you have to be ready at all times. And the other thing is that in a lot of these sort of consulting engagements, it's chaos. They call it chaos engineering. It's rare you're going to walk into a situation where it's greenfield. That takes time to get to those sort of clients. You're being called in because they probably have tried everything else at this point. Nothing else is working. And so I've met people who are not capable from a personality perspective to handle the hands off. Like you don't own this. Stop acting like you do and being able to handle the chaos where the code isn't going to be perfect because it can't be perfect because the environment just doesn't allow it. So your job is just to keep throwing band-aids and bubble gum and maybe clean it up a little bit as you can, but you go home at night and you don't care about it. So yeah, you can make a lot of money doing this, but if you're somebody who cares, really cares, it will drive you crazy because that caring is actually getting in your way. And so I tell people to try it out because if you can deal with the chaos and deal with helping people where you can and when you can, and at the same time, deal with everything that's going around you. And there are people who love that. I've met people who love the chaos. In fact, the more messed up the code base is, the better. They love- (laughs) Is that how you are? No, actually I'm not. I am. I've learned, I had to learn how to be that person. I wasn't when I started. My business partner helped a lot trying to teach me the right attitude. The solve problems quickly and cheaply attitude versus having this immaculate engineering machine that you've designed over years. Get things done, make them stable, get things done, move on to the next thing. Don't worry about all those other little things you want to worry about. What helped me balance that was the training because then I could build training products with what I wanted, how I wanted to engineer as opposed to how I had to engineer in there. I've met people who love that and it's brilliant. And then I've met people who just fail, not because they're not good engineers. They just can't put themselves in the right mindset. They need to be in a product company. They need to have the sprint. They need to, and they excel in that environment and it's great. So I think you have to be real honest with yourself and who you are and what you need to maintain any sort of mental wellness. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. If you're not sure, then try the consulting. See if you're thriving in this crazy world. If you're not, then the next choice is, do you want to do a startup or do you want to go into a VMware? Because they're product companies, but they're completely different sort of product companies too. One, it's going to move very slow. You have job security for life. You'll have a good starting salary. It moves very slow. You'll have a lot of time for personal stuff. You're probably not going to be challenged a lot every day. And 
it's that sort of laid back maybe life. But if you want to go into a startup, then you better expect that you're working all the time. Even if you're not at work, it's in your head, right? Yeah. Oh man, I forgot to do that. Oh, now I remember why that's not working. And probably taking the laptop out on a weekend, not because you have to, because you want to. And you're being challenged and you're probably doing a lot more things than you normally would have done. And there are people who thrive in that. There are people who don't. And as you get older, it changes. I'm at a point where, you know, I'm happy working 40 hours a week, but I don't want to really work on the weekends and I don't want to do, I'm tired, right? Like I've done that. I slept on couches for three days in a row trying to yeah. get something. That isn't running anymore. So what about those three days I lost? I think the best advice is you just get, need to get a feel for not just your own personality, but like what the pros and cons of all these things are, and then just make a decision and try it. I've always liked startups because I just have to have something to do and think about constantly. I suffer from boredom. I cannot be bored. And so I've been at larger companies where kind of the project dries up for a week and you don't really have anything interesting to do. And that drives me crazy. But you can balance that if you had product ideas, then it's huge because they're not challenging you. In fact, they're only giving you about 30 hours a week and you supplement what you need building like I did with the training, building something else. So this is why I'm saying that everybody has to be super honest with themselves in what it is that they're, they want and then go after those. I met, there was a time where it actually, it happens today. Uh, I don't see it as much because I'm not traveling as much, but I would meet people all the time and they say, Man, I should be learning Kubernetes. I should be learning Kubernetes. I should be learning Kubernetes. I should be learning ML. I should be learning AI. I should be learning ML. And when I hear the same person say that six or seven times over the course of two months, I will, and I've done this, I have finally stopped them. We're walking down the street. And this is the seventh time they've said I should be learning it. And I stop them and I go, listen to me. I don't want to hear this idea that you don't have time because you have time. Everybody has time. Everybody will make time for the things they want to do. This is not an issue about time. It's an issue about attention. And you obviously don't want to put your attention into this because if you did, you'd be doing it, right? <laughs> so stop yeah. beating yourself up because the next thing on Twitter was chat GPT and you didn't build an API to it. You didn't do it because you weren't interested in it. And it's okay that you're not interested in that. Let everybody else try to jump on the bullet train for the next three weeks and you just stay here and relax. It's the same thing I'm seeing now with blue sky, right? Everybody wants a blue sky invitation, right? Yeah. I'm just sitting back. I can wait until general availability. I'm busy enough on Twitter right now. I can wait. Like the idea of FOMO can severely impact you, right? And severely yeah. impact your attention. And I feel fight it all the time, right? I'm, you fight, because what do you do? You see all these people that you look up to and they're jumping on the chat GPT, they're jumping on blue sky, they're jumping on, and you're like, man, I should be on there if they're on there, right? I'm not cool if I'm not doing this stuff, right? And you gotta just fight it because, first of all, it's a fad and it's gonna go away. And then second of all, if you really wanna do it, you can do it, but you didn't, yeah. so why not? We need mo motivational talks by Bill Kennedy. I hope your next conference talk is a motivational one. I, okay, the problem that you're describing, this I call it like shiny thing syndrome, where like you're unable to go deep on some topic that you know you really care about because you keep jumping back and forth between different things. So for example, I work with a lot of people who are just starting to learn to code. Maybe they're in their first like one to three months of dabbling in this whole coding thing. And one common problem that I see is people quickly switching between languages, frameworks, and tech stacks. Like today Go is interesting, tomorrow it's Node. Oh, I heard about this new bun runtime. I need to install that and try it out. And my recommendation has always been like, you just need to focus, you need to focus the attention and then just go do it. I don't know how else to say it other than you just need to go deeper on the thing that you set out to do within a three month time frame that you've been searching and surfing YouTube videos, the thing you need to learn to break into the industry probably hasn't changed. It takes 10,000 hours to be an expert in anything that you're doing. 
whether it's tech, sports, drinking Mountain Dew like you are, it takes 10,000 hours. So if you don't put 10,000 hours into something, which I think one time I calculated it out, maybe it's five years, depending on how much, how many hours a day you're working on it, then you're never going to be proficient enough to get any sort of, say, job or position or in sports, the opportunity to compete at that highest level. You're just not. So again, it comes down to what sort of problems do you want to solve? Start solving those problems. Try to leverage the tech that you've already started putting, you've already put a hundred hours. So let me give you this. My, my wife, Ali, she just finished a boot camp in Miami. Okay. She spent basically two months hedged down learning JavaScript frameworks, HTML, CSS. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So she put in whatever that is, right? Already 300 hours, three, maybe 500 hours, let's say. Okay. You have 500 hours out of your 10,000 already in. Now school is done, right? Yeah. And it's so easy now to turn around and say, Bill, I want to learn Go. I can teach you Go, but you're starting over. You're already 500 hours in. And it's not like there aren't a billion jobs out there in this tech once you get to 2,000 hours. Right. right? Once you get to 2,000 hours, you're going to get a job. So do you want to take the 500 hours you've already invested and get halfway there being an expert and working, or do you want to start over again every two months? Because if you just keep starting over every two months, then you're not going to be employable anywhere. Again, what is your goal? If you're retired and you don't care, then 500 hours is enough for anything you're doing because you got enough of a feel for it and you want to do something else. But if your job is to make money, to have a job, then you got to work towards the 5,000 hours to make yourself employable. So this is actually a really interesting topic because there's actually two, there's two separate things I heard you say. And one of them I definitely agree with. The other one I'm actually not so sure. If you spend 500 hours learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then you switch to, say, a new programming language, but you're learning new concepts... I would argue that's just fine. So, for example, in my in my four year CS degree, which I'm not, uh, I started boot dev. I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of CS degrees in general, but there's all these concepts you need to learn, right? Things like how the internet works, domain name system, databases, algorithms, data structures, all these higher level concepts, and then you like use and learn specific technologies to implement those concepts in the real world. And in my mind. It's really important to learn all of those concepts and keep making that like deep progress along that axis. But, that's, but you could have learned all of that while staying in JavaScript and got to a thousand hours of JavaScript while still learning all those fundamental things. You got to put in, the, you got to go towards those 5,000 hours. I don't yeah. know how many hours you're going to need to get the job. Let's say he's going to be, a, I just saw her do 500. And I think she could take an entry level job. I know if she does another 500, it's going to look even better. And if she puts another 500 there, it gets so every 500 gets you, every two months gets you closer. You need a problem to solve, which is what I try to tell people all the time. My service repo, which is what I use to train and teach how to build services, is technically mm -hmm. a product. It's a web API for a garage sale. Like, it's a project. It's real. I build that thing like this thing's in production. The fact that it's a garage sale doesn't excite me. But the fact that I have to maintain users and products and CRUD and like these are standard things regardless of whatever you're going to be doing. So you need the project anyway. I think that's great advice generally. I'm huge. I'm big on project building. But what project should say someone who's learning Go and wants to get a job as a Go developer, what are the best like one or two kinds of projects that you can build, or maybe the advice that you could follow to come up with that, th th those like one or two ideas for what projects you should be building in Go specifically. This is what I would say. And I, I talked to my wife about this as well. She's in a place right now where 
because there are so many people looking for work and the economy is falling apart and there's openings, but the 5,000 hour people are getting them right now because there's just too many of them. What do you do? Do you know how many nonprofits there are right now that need software development? You're looking for something to problem to solve? Go knock on a local nonprofit and tell, ask them, what technology problems do you have right now? Maybe you'll get lucky and they need some sort of website that could leverage some backend APIs. Why not work on that? There's no stress. You ain't getting paid. There's no timetable. <laughs> right. You now have a problem that you have to solve. So you get to learn without any stress. And you're helping the community out at the same time. And then on your resume, I'll show you how to make that look like you were working at a job because you technically <laughs> were. You know, you weren't getting paid, but we don't put salaries on resumes, do we? So right. now under experience, you were working with 501c3 nonprofit blank building software. This wasn't school. It wasn't education. It was a job. It happened to be pro bono, but who cares? And so this is what I'm going to say to you, okay? If you have that time, and you're looking for a project, there are a ton of nonprofit organizations all over the place that would love your help. And maybe part of that project isn't fun and fancy for you. Maybe there's a browser front end piece to it. Then get your friend who loves front end to do that and let them learn how to work and get together as a team. And you do all the back end APIs and the database stuff. And who imagine if everybody did that, how much better the world would be. I love that advice. If you're looking for a project, go find a nonprofit or an organization, someone who has a real world problem, go solve it with code, put it on your resume. Bill will teach you how to engineer your resume and, uh, and everything will work out. I love that. Thank you. I think that is a great thing to end on. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Take a moment, plug your stuff. You know me, man. <laughs> My marketing department hates me because I'm not that person. I'm Look, I'm not... It's about making sure that everybody gets the educational materials that they need. This is all I care about. And I try to make sure that everything I'm doing, whether it's the ultimate Go class that teaches the language or ultimate service, just teaching how to build services or whatever it is, it's real practical stuff that you can take. If you go on ArdenLabs.com and you see any of our educational stuff, our video bundles and things, and it's too expensive for you, you are to send me an email at bill at ardenlabs.com. Send me an email. I will send you a scholarship form where you basically get to set your own price. That's and That's If you can't afford any of it, you say zero. And I will give it to you. You just need, and I don't, there's no policing. You are, to be honest with yourself about what you can't afford. But I can only afford 20 bucks. <laughs> Here. All right. So if you see stuff on Arden Labs, if you see anything that I'm doing from an educational standpoint, you see a live class, you want access, don't worry about the price. Just reach out to me. We'll work it out. That's all I'm going to say. Everybody has a different personality. Everybody's trying to teach the same things. So you can come and check my stuff out for free. If I'm resonating with you, brilliant. If not, you tell me, Bill, I'm not, I've given money back. And then I'll yeah. send you over to Johnny. We're all friends. We love each other. It's not about that. It's just about you getting the education that you think you need to be able to improve. Fantastic. Thanks so much. I hope some people take you up on that. That's art. It's ardenlabs.com, right? Yeah. A-R-D-A-N labs, ardenlabs.com. Ardenlabs.com and going at goingo.net on Twitter. Thanks so much, Will. Okay.